Section 1 You'll hear two travellers, Lilith and Alex, having a discussion in a cafe. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. you'll see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hey, Alex, are you okay? I was worried something happened. Oh, sorry for being late. I drove down the wrong highway and got lost. Don't worry, it's only been 20 minutes. Actually, I just looked at some tourist websites. I got some tea. You want anything? Lilith has been waiting for 20 minutes. So the answer is C. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hey, Alex, are you okay? I was worried something happened. Oh, sorry for being late. I drove down the wrong highway and got lost. Don't worry, it's only been 20 minutes. Actually, I just looked at some Austin tourist websites. I got some tea. You want anything? Yeah, I think I have some tomato juice. It's just what I need right now. Yes, it's really hot and humid out right now. I think I'll get iced tea this time around. So you went on the wrong highway, huh? Yeah, for sure. I've never driven in this area before, right? So after I pick up the rental car from the airport, I try to follow the map to the downtown area here. Unfortunately, there was a lot of road construction going on, and I went south on the highway instead of going north. After a few minutes, I realized I was going the wrong way, so I exited the highway and came back up here. Well, I'm glad you're here, okay? Did everything go well at the car rental place? Oh, yeah, it went very well. The business owner was kind of a strange person, really tall and thin. He had a bushy beard and moustache. He was also wearing a cowboy hat. I'd never quite seen anyone quite like that before. I guess every place in the world has eccentric people. Yeah, definitely. But he told me about all these great places to eat around here. He said they have some really great Mexican food in the area. That's great. I haven't had that in such a long time. We definitely have to go to a place for dinner. Well, I want some more iced tea. How about you? Yeah, I need to order still. You know what? I think I'll get one of their sandwiches too. They look really good. Okay, let's order then. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now then, what are we going to do today? I was thinking it would be nice to see the state capital and then maybe the university. Well, according to the website, let me see. The state capital has tours only on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. Yeah, if we went there, it would be much better to go on a guided tour. Oh, wait. Yes, there are tours on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, but also on Saturdays. The university site lists a lot of places that are interesting, so maybe we can spend most of the day at both the capital and there. We should definitely go to the lake after that as well and even spend the night camping there. Great plan. Is there anything else you found online? Yeah, I know you studied biology, so I was thinking that the park would be good. They have a pretty unique collection of trees and plants. They are open Monday through Saturday, so we can go there any time. There's also the mountain. There are some photos on the website. It looks like they have some great views of the city, and I definitely want to do some hiking. Yes, we would have to take another day for the park and the mountain. But you know, the guy at the rental place was talking about the weather. It seems that there will be a pretty bad storm coming tomorrow. We need to plan around that since it won't be good to be outside when it comes. Certainly not. 
It's not worth hiking somewhere if the weather is terrible. You know, we can go to the park and the mountain today and then go to the indoor places, the capital and the university tomorrow. It'll be hard to get around in the rain, but at least we'll be inside. I agree. By the way, how much are these places? All of them are free except for the park. Wait, I'm not sure about the capital tour. Yeah, they don't charge anything for the guided tours. All right, then. We'll go hiking first and then relax at the park. Then we can camp at the lake. We'll go to the capital and the university tomorrow. Yeah, this is one of the best universities in the country, especially known for their art programs. Really? Yeah, I heard about that. They have some art galleries there, too, ones with some good modern art. Wow, it seems like that's a lot for us. Yeah, I'm really excited about camping at the lake. The sunsets are supposed to be beautiful there. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a speaker talking about saving energy in the home. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 12. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 12. Many thanks for inviting me along to talk about saving energy in the home. This is a key issue for many people who now find themselves on tight budgets. So today I'd like to spend a few minutes going through some simple tips to help keep those energy bills to a minimum. I'll start with some easy, cheap ideas before talking about more major solutions later. I think we're all aware of the importance of insulating our homes, and although I'd advise you to get it done, I appreciate it can sometimes be inconvenient to have building work carried out. And though they're growing in popularity, having solar panels installed on the roof isn't a cheap enough option for many of us to consider seriously. So what other steps can we take? Well, most people will make a point of turning the heating down when temperatures outside rise, but they ignore other equally useful ways of saving energy when they're making dinner or doing their weekly laundry. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 13 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 13 to 20. If you're living in a relatively new apartment or house, you're probably blessed with a cosy, draft-free living space. But for those of us in older properties, the chances are there are gaps all over the place where cold air is getting in. Walk around your home and place the back of your hand around window frames. Can you feel cold air coming in from outside? Get down on your knees at the doors. Is there a draft at floor level? Fix these drafts with some cheap draft excluders and savings in heating bills will begin straight away. And are you using the latest energy-saving light bulbs? I'm not recommending you go around your entire property throwing out older ones and replacing them all immediately. 
But next time a bulb goes, make sure you buy an energy efficient alternative. And what about heating? If you have radiators in every room, do you need them all switched on throughout the day? If they're on timers, set them efficiently. Then there's the laptop or your TV. Do you leave them switched on overnight or on standby? Don't waste money. Turn them off. And that goes for lights as well. You'd be surprised how many people leave them on when they go out. There are also guaranteed savings to be made in the kitchen. I'm always telling my husband not to overfill the kettle when he makes a cup of tea. Why boil more water than you actually need? When you consider how many times that kettle gets used every day, you'll appreciate just how much electricity can be saved by boiling what you need and no more. And the next time you're cooking pasta or potatoes, keep a lid on the pot. The water will boil much more quickly than if you leave it off. And if you've bought yourself a pressure cooker or steamer and it's sitting in the cupboard never being used, get it out. They're much more efficient than pots and pans. Now, the refrigerator and freezer. If the fridge is next to the cooker, it's having to work harder to stay cold. But as I'm giving cheap, easy solutions here, a kitchen redesign might be out of the question. Still, there are other energy-saving steps you can take. Keep an eye on the temperature control. We often forget to turn it down in the colder winter months when a high setting is unnecessary. Also, remember to defrost the freezer frequently and try not to overfill it, as this isn't the most efficient way of using it. The washing machine is another potential money saver. A lot of people wash at 40 degrees Celsius, but it's often okay to drop the temperature down to 30 degrees Celsius with similar results. And remember to either wash full loads or select the half load program. Again, a surprising number of people forget to do this. And is it really necessary to dry your clothes in a tumble dryer? If you have a garden or a yard, hang them outside. Or if you're drying them inside, get yourself a cheap clothes rail rather than hanging things over radiators, which robs you of valuable heat. Now, let's turn to some of the help our local council is offering to householders to save energy. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You will hear a discussion among three students who are organising an international film festival at their college. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully to the first part of the discussion and answer questions 21 to 24. Thanks for coming to this meeting on such short notice, Anna and Veronica. It looks like we have just become the organising committee for this year's International Film Festival. We've all just met, so perhaps we should start by an introduction with a bit of background from each of us. OK, I'm Anna. I finished three years of a languages degree in Sweden, where I come from. This year I decided to study overseas to get to know a different part of the world. I'm also a big fan of European cinema, especially French and Italian. Those are the languages I majored in, along with English. To me, film is a great way to learn about the rest of the world. I was in the film club at my university, so when I saw the notice asking for volunteers, I thought it would be a good way to meet people and get involved in something I really enjoy. Thanks, Anna. My name is Veronica and I come from Italy. I'm doing graduate studies in English literature. I went to some of the films in the festival last year and enjoyed them. I especially like the video interviews. That was when I decided to get involved. I used to do film reviews for our student newspaper back home. 
Hi, I'm Chris from Scotland and I'm in fourth year journalism. Cinema is my hobby. Last year I joined the organising committee just like you have now and somehow this year I've ended up in charge. I'm actually able to use my coordinating work on the festival towards a credit for one of my courses. I have to write up a report on the festival with recommendations so that's an extra motivation for me. So I hope this is going to be a good experience for us all. Okay, where would you like to start? How about a general overview of the festival? I don't really know much about it. Well, the film festival was started by International Student Society five years ago and has grown every year. It is held over four nights during study break, Wednesday to Saturday. Normally we show three films a night. Last year we tried to choose films from different parts of the world that fit together in some way maybe a similar theme. Or we could feature a type of film like action films or science fiction. Now you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 25 to 30. Who picks the films? It's up to us on the committee to decide. You mean we get to pick all the films ourselves? What a hard decision. There are so many to choose from. Well, that's the fun part. We have this catalogue of independent distributors. The films are listed by language and have a short summary. We just have to go through it to find a good combination of films that will attract an audience. Veronica mentioned something about interviews. How does that fit in? We set up cameras in the foyer of the theatre and did live interviews before, during intermission and after the screening. Anyone from the audience could come up and talk about the film. The Broadcasting and Journalism School set it up and ran the interviews. They were shown on big screens around the lobby and in the theatre. It went over really well. We had a long lineup of students waiting to be interviewed on TV. Everybody wanted their minute of fame. Great idea. Yeah, it worked really well. We should certainly do something similar again. Maybe even develop the idea further, like a website with audience reviews and discussion, so we can get as much participation and involvement as possible. Hey, that's a good idea. Can I ask a question? None of the films are in English, right? Are they dubbed or subtitled? Well, we do occasionally choose a film in English, but only from unusual places where the dialect is so strong they sometimes need subtitles, like the Caribbean or even Scotland. The majority of films in the festival are foreign language, dubbed in English. We've learned from experience that students don't like reading subtitles. Maybe they read too much already. Whatever the reason, the subtitled films get smaller audiences, so we avoid them as much as possible. So how large an audience can we expect and how much does it cost to get in? It costs $5 per film or a $20 pass for the whole event. All 12 films for the real movie fan. We would have broken even last year, except for a bad storm on the Friday night. We almost had to cancel the whole thing. But overall, we had a good turnout. More than 2,000 people in four days. Oh, that's what I was wondering about. The financial part. Where does the funding come from? What kind of budget do we have? The festival is subsidised by the Student Council. We generate money through advertising and through admission charges. We'll go over the budget in details a little later, but we've got lots of work to do in the meantime. I guess we have to start pretty soon. Well, I think by the 1st of March at the latest. We need to select all the films. Then we have to find some advertisers to sponsor the event. That shouldn't be too hard. We'll just start with last year's list. Our deadline for that should be the middle of March. By the end of March, we need to design the programme. Then we can get posters made up and distributed in April. Like you said, we need some clever promotion. 
Something to generate interest and get people talking. We have four months to get ready. It should be enough time. OK, where do we start? Let's start by talking about films, since that is the best part, and see what we come up with. What was the best film you saw last year? That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a woman talking to a group of first-year science undergraduates about the developing science of nanotechnology. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Today we're going to look at an important area of science, namely nanotechnology. So, what is it? Nano means tiny, so it's science and engineering on the scale of atoms and molecules. The idea is that by controlling and rearranging atoms, you can literally create anything. However, as we'll see, the science of the small has some big implications, affecting us in many ways. There's no doubt that nanotechnology promises so much for civilization. However, all new technologies have their teething problems. And with nanotechnology, society often gets the wrong idea about its capabilities. Numerous science fiction books and movies have raised people's fears about nanotechnology, with scenarios such as inserting little nanorobots into your body that monitor everything you do without you realising it, or self-replicating nanorobots that eventually take over the world. So... How do we safeguard such a potentially powerful technology? Some scientists recommend that nanoparticles be treated as new chemicals, with separate safety tests and clear labelling. They believe that greater care should also be taken with nanoparticles in laboratories and factories. Others have called for a withdrawal of new nanoproducts, such as cosmetics, and a temporary halt to many kinds of nanotech research. But as far as I'm concerned, there's a need to plough ahead with the discoveries and applications of nanotechnology. I really believe that most scientists would welcome a way to guard against unethical uses of such technology. We can't go around thinking that all innovation is bad, all advancement is bad. As with the debate about any new technology, it is how you use it that's important. So, let's look at some of its possible uses. Thanks to nanotechnology, there could be a major breakthrough in the field of transportation, with the production of more durable metals. These could be virtually unbreakable, lighter and much more pliable, leading to planes that are 50 times lighter than at present. Those same improved capabilities will dramatically reduce the cost of travelling into space, making it more accessible to ordinary people, 
and opening up a totally new holiday destination. In terms of technology, the computer industry will be able to shrink computer parts down to minute sizes. We need nanotechnology in order to create a new generation of computers that will work even faster and will have a million times more memory, but will be about the size of a sugar cube. Nanotechnology could also revolutionise the way that we generate power. The cost of solar cells will be drastically reduced, so harnessing this energy will be far more economical than at present. But nanotechnology has much wider applications than this and could have an enormous impact on our environment. For instance, tiny airborne nanorobots could be programmed to actually rebuild the ozone layer, which could lessen the impact of global warming on our planet. <laughs> That's a pretty amazing thought, isn't it? On a more local scale, this new technology could help with the clean-up of environmental disasters as nanotechnology will allow us to remove oil and other contaminants from the water far more effectively. And if nanotechnology progresses as expected, as a sort of building block set of about 90 atoms, then you could build anything you wanted from the bottom up. In terms of production, this means that you only use what you need and so there wouldn't be any waste. The notion that you could create anything at all has major implications for our health. It means that we'll eventually be able to replicate anything. This would have a phenomenal effect on our society. In time, it could even lead to the eradication of famine through the introduction of machines that produce food to feed the hungry. But it's in the area of medicine that nanotechnology may have its biggest impact. How we detect disease will change as tiny biosensors are developed to analyse tests in minutes rather than days. There's even speculation nanorobots could be used to slow the ageing process, lengthening life expectancy. As you can see, I'm very excited by the implications that could be available to us in the next few decades. Just how long it'll take, I honestly don't know. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.